My name is John Paul Harper. I'm an Andrews resident. My mother and father was Clara and Samuel P. Harper. Samuel Harper. And they called him Paul. I'm sorry. Samuel Paul Harper. I was drafted into the Army, assigned to the Air Force. After my training in the States, we were sent to England. In England, we were sent to an airfield. An airfield is nothing more than just an army camp with airplanes. There were 40 such airfields built in England for the 8th Air Force. The 8th Air Force didn't call these fields, they called them bomb groups. Ours was the 492nd Bomb Group. One note, the aerial gunners on, these, on the 8th Air Force Average 19 years of age, and that meant that some 6,000 18 year old boys were flying in this airplane. In our bomb group, the 492nd Bomb Group, we flew the B 24 Liberator. This was a four engine airplane, it carried 10 men. He carried a pilot, co-pilot, radio operator, navigator, bombardier, and five aerial gunners. I was the nose gunner. I sat in a turret right in the very part of the front of the nose. We started flying missions over Germany. And on August the 4th, 1944, this was just two months after D-Day, we were shot down over Kiel, Germany. We were shot down by anti-aircraft. This was what we call flak. The flak could actually tear an airplane apart. On that day, we were bombing the submarines that were based at Kiel, Germany. Kiel is in the northern part of Germany on the Baltic Sea. We dropped our bombs and started to turn to come home. That's when the anti-aircraft gunners found our altitude and our speed, and they covered us up with flak. We took a direct hit in the right outboard engine, and it stopped running. We took, in one minute, we lost the left inboard engine to flak. Then we took a direct hit in the waist of the airplane. The aerial gunner lost, took a, he suffered a terrible leg wound, and as he went down, he cried out over the intercom. Because we were taking so many hits in the nose of the airplane, the bombardier and the navigator who worked right behind the turret thought I was the one that was hit and I was the one that cried out. So they opened the doors to my turret and jerked me out of that turret. I got up off the floor and I said, there's nothing wrong with me. Before, we, before I could get back into the turret, we took a direct hit there. Then the turret wouldn't work. The uh, bombardier suffered a horrible head wound and none of the equipment, about half of the instruments were broken. The three of us decided we would go to the flight deck. There was no reason to stay in the front. There was nothing I could do in the flight deck, so I went to the back of the airplane. I went through the bomb bay, went to the back. By the time I got to the back of the airplane, the tail gunner had been wounded. And I noticed that the left outboard engine was running, but it was smoking. I knew then that we'd have to get out of that airplane and do it right now. Waste gunner that was wounded so badly. He was in and out of consciousness. We knew he couldn't open his parachute. We wore a chest type parachute, had a handle on it. We tied a rope around the handle, tied the other end to the top of the roof of the crane, opened the escape hatch, and we pushed him out, his chute open. Then we all jumped out. But after I got on the ground, I was captured about a half an hour later by a German soldier. 
<clears throat> was taken into a town called Leet, Germany. So we spent the night there. The next morning they took us to a Dulag. A Dulag is an interrogation center that the Germans used to interrogate American flyers. They put us in individual cells at the Dulag. They would take us out from time to time to interrogate us. The German officer and the guard would get furious when we wouldn't answer questions, but as a prisoner of war, you only had to give them your name, your rank, and your serial number. They would threaten you, but the, they didn't harm us really at that time. I don't know how many interviews I, didn't, I went through, but I was there, I figured, about five days. After that period of time, and a number of interviews, they took us up, put us on a rail car, and sent us to a prison camp. Our prison camp was known as Starlog Luf 4. It was located in what is now Poland. It was in the northeast corner of Poland, not far from the Baltic Sea and not too far from the Russian border. This camp held 10,000 American flyers, one of the biggest prison camps in Germany. We lived in barracks. There were, in each compound, there were 10 barracks, each barracks had 10 rooms, each room held 25 men. The end of the room was, had triple jump bunk beds, had one small stove, one, ta one table, two benches, one light bulb, and one gallon bucket. They fed us twice a day. They gave us a bucket of soup in the morning, a bucket of boiled potatoes in the afternoon. The 25 guys would put their cups and sauces on a table. One guy would divide up that bucket of soup and that bucket of uh, potatoes. It would amount to just about a cup of soup and a cup of potatoes a day. In addition to that, the Red Cross would send us a food parcel. It had canned food and non-perishable food. It was designed to last a prisoner for one week he could survive on that. The problem is we never got a full parcel. We only got a half a parcel at best. The German guards at Starlog the four were not great, not the greatest. Some of them were cruel, some were bad. There was one in particular, one that we call Big Stoop. He, he was really Sergeant Smith, a huge man, a vicious man, a cruel man and he took great delight in beating and the prisoner. Everybody that passed through Starlog Lift knew who Big Stoop was. Life in the camp was, it was really slow, it was boring, but at that, air, that place it was extremely cold all the time, it was so far no, In 1945 came around, the Russian army was getting fairly close. So in February the 6th, 1945, the Germans decided to evacuate our prison camp. The people that w couldn't walk were taken up by trucks, but most of us were gonna be forced to walk out of the camp. They split us up in groups of about 300 and sent the guards and we would leave the prison on that, on February the 6th, 1945. On the first day, one of the guards told us that we would only be walking for f three days. The three days turned into be 86 days of walking. After the first night, we realized we would have to form combines. <clears throat> a combine is three guys that would agree to sleep together because you could you'd have three blankets for warmth rather than one. We would share food, we would share all of our water, and we would march together in case one got hurt, the other two could help. 
on this march. We slept in fields, the woods, barns, and bombed out factories wherever we happened to be at night. They did not take us on the major roads and the autobahn, they took us on back roads and we would back, backtrack many, many days. So the total distance of this march, we, nobody really ever knew. We ran out of food after about 10 days. We had to drink water out of rivers, streams, and sometimes even ditches. We had to scrounge around as best we could to find food because the Germans gave us very little food on this march. The Red Cross did their best to get food to us, but they didn't know where we would be. But they would leave it in little towns and we got some food from the Red Cross. And without that, we would have never survived that morning. After about the second week or third week, we all had dysentery, we had lice, we had blisters, sores, and colds. As this march continued, it got harder and harder, and then fatigue and starvation started to set in. We, we continued this march we, from Poland. We walked all the way across the north, northern part of Poland and most of Germany. We got to a town, Utzen, Germany. We ran into the British Army. They didn't want to surrender us to the British, so we then turned to the southwest and started toward the city of Berlin. Well, they weren't going to take us into the city, so we bypassed that. And we kept going until we ran into the Russians again. And then we turned back to the west, and we kept going until we got to a town called Bitterfield, Bitterfield Germany. And there we were liberated by General Patton's 101st. Timberwolf Division. That afternoon, I was standing on the side of the road, and I can't tell you just how it felt to be liberated from those Germans. That night, the frontline troops didn't eat their dinner so that we would have food. Now there was more of us than it was of them, but we had some food and it was good food. After we ate, the medics came by and said, guys, you got to throw it up. You can't keep that rich food on your stomach. You'll be sick and really ill in the morning. So we did. The next day, they flew us out of Bitterfield and flew us to Camp Lucky Strike an American multifacet base near La Havre, France. We got there, and I was reflecting on what we had done. We had just walked nearly three months. We had walked well over 500 miles. Most of the people say it was over 600 miles. We, were, we had lost a third of our body weight. We were sick, we were exhausted, but we were free. And at Camp Lucky Strike, they gave us a bath, a shave, and a haircut, clean clothes, and food. The very next day, General Eisenhower flew into Camp Lucky Strike to welcome us home. He got out of his airplane, stepped up on the platform, everybody started clapping. He picked up a microphone and he said, stop that clapping. I am not a movie star. My name is Ike and I'm a soldier just like you. Later that day, I had the great good fortune of actually meeting General Eisenhower. We shook hands and we chatted for quite a spell. I was really surprised that a five-star general would talk to a staff sergeant that long. The next day, they put us into a quote of quote a field hospital, fed us four meals a day, all the snacks we could eat. While we were there in that quote field hospital, 
Germany surrendered. Then they sent us home. And when we got back to the States, they gave us a furlough to go home to visit our family. While I was home on furlough, President Truman ordered the dropping of the two bombs. The Japan surrendered. World War II was over. The killing stopped. But I always say we should never forget that over 400,000 young men died during this war. They died for our freedom. And God bless the soldiers, and God bless America. And that's about it. were you able to fly bombing missions before you were shot down? We, we were shot down on our fifth bombing mission. And, and, and you can speak to this more than I can, but I've heard that going out on a bombing mission, the percentages were not necessarily in your favor. No, they weren't. Right. They were not. They were just, uh, the official number of airplanes we had was 117 of them. And the official number that were lost, and this was in all, all kind of losses, whatever they happened to be, was 72 of them, which is a little over half of the airplane. There were only six crews in the whole 492nd that ever finished the required missions they were supposed to fly. Now, I might say this about that. When you would go on a mission, they would wake you up about 4.30 in the morning. You'd go, you'd go to the briefing. Briefing was in a Quincy hut. They had this big map on the wall that showed you what the target was, how you would, route you'd fly in, the route you'd fly out, your bombs, your rounds of ammunition, gasoline, everything you needed to know to fly that mission. And after they'd finished that briefing, not one man would get up out of his chair until the chaplain came in. After that, they would take us and we would fly. Now, the Air Force would not make you fly. You had to volunteer to fly. And my entire career, after we all got overseas, now, I've never known one guy that refused to fly. about your 10-man crew. Do you know what happened to some of them? Well, um, of course, as far as I know, all of them are dead now. I kept up with some of them and visited some, but some I didn't. Some were just, but they, as far as I know, they all, now the pilot, he stayed in the Army and was a career guy. Uh, the tail gunner and I were very close friends. We talked many times together, and we'd talk regularly on the telephone. The navigator and myself would visit each other, and we would talk to each other quite, uh, not often, but we would do that. And the waste gunner, uh, I, would, I knew him, you know, and we talked on the phone. And those were the major ones that I talked to. The rest of them, we sort of lost contract. But they all made it home. All, we, all, when we, got, when we, we had time on that airplane because we knew they had, we had time to get out. All 10 of us got out. That's nearly a miracle because very few at times any ship plane went down, all 10 men got, because once it started going down, you couldn't get up. And I'm guessing where you went down, no, nobody got back to behind the enemy lines. No, no, all, all were captured. Every, all of them were captured. Now, in one of the guys, the ball turret guy, and the gunner and myself, we were in the same room and in the same prison uh, camp. The rest of them were in different camps and different uh, compounds. When, we, when the camp was evacuated, they say that it was probably the coldest winter they'd had in years and years, but it seemed like it snowed every day. It was very cold, very bitter. And when you 
what did they, did you have anything to wear that helped with that at all? Or no, we, we had decent clothes. The Red Cross got clothes. Most of it was Army clothes. So we did have a good, we had a long overcoat. We The shoes were not the greatest, but they lasted us. We made it all last, and but we kept the same clothes. But now, when you think of going for three months without taking a bath, now the filth was horrible. And we won't talk much about that, but it's just really, it, 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 to what we had to do and go through, it was just, it, we were filthy, we were dirty and everything, but that was, um, just the way it was, but it was cold. It, I mean, that part, of, particularly, we were so far north. It was just bitter cold. Mm -hmm. And when when you made camp every night, did, were there even fires, or did you just bed down in the? No, no, snow? we would. When we would stop, like I say, we'd we'd slept in fields and in woods and in barracks and barns. When we would get inside or get outside, you just lay down together. The three of you would lay down and you'd take your blankets and you'd put over the top or you'd move the snow around or you'd put one down and you'd sit on it. Of course, if you, if you did, it'd get wet, but that's just, you just had to do what you had to do. You didn't take any clothes off anything. Of course, at the very beginning, you wouldn't have taken your shoes off because your sleep feet would have swollen up. You wouldn't have got your shoes back on. But, uh, we just slept wherever we happened to be, and they would bunch you up like cattle so you'd be real close. And to give you an idea of the filth, if you had to relieve yourself at night, they would, you'd have to do it right where you were sleeping. And so the filth was horrible. And on the march, if a guy had to do it in the daytime, they would just, he'd have to go right on the road. And, and then the other people walking, it just, it was just, filth was just terrible. I don't know why they did that to us, but that's. Because they were running. Uh, they, they were surrounded. I guess so. <laughs> so, um, did, did anyone die on the march? Yep. Now, how many? I don't have any idea. I can't. Nobody. I don't think would know because there was no. You really didn't know how many was in your group when you started off. So you, how would you know? But you know that people would drop out. Sometime a guy would drop out. Normally, a guard would stop with him, and then after a while, you know, maybe fifteen or twenty minutes. The guard would, you'd see him, but you'd never see the guy anymore. And any time a, drop, any time a guy dropped out of that march, you never saw that guy again. I don't know what ever happened to him. You can hear anything, but it... I went to college on the GI Bill of Rights and got a degree in forestry. Where'd you go then? <laughs> then I went to work for an international paper company right here in Georgetown. And I worked for them for nearly 20 years. I worked in the, the two Carolinas in Georgia. And then I moved to Great Northern Paper Company, and from there I went to Chesapeake Paper Company in Virginia and retired there after 20 years. I worked for over 40 years in forestry. When I was at PC Presbyterian College, my roommate was my cousin from King Street, South Carolina. And Bub was killed in the Battle of the Bulge. And he was Bub Montgomery. He was in the infantry? No, he was in the infantry. Inf yep. But I'll bet you didn't find that out for a little while because you were... Oh, no, I didn't find out that I was back home for... Yeah. I, I was back home for... When, when you were at the, at the camp, did you ever... Were you ever able to get anything from home? Did they... I never got anything from home. I was... Uh, my mother and my wife, and I was married then. We were married I, when, after I got into service. Married my uh, high school sweetheart. But anyway, they sent packages. I don't know how you, you could get the Red Cross to send packages every, I don't think it was every week, it was maybe every month. But I never got a package. They wrote letters, I never got a letter. Now, I did write letters to my mother and to my wife, and letters in court. Now, they got a few of those. 
your your brothers. Oh yeah, there was. Yes. <laughs> Tell okay. me about your brothers. Okay, there were four of us, and actually when the war started, there were two of us still in high school, but all four brothers ended up in the war. The oldest brother, Sam, he was in the China Theater. He was he was a, in the Air Force, a navigator and the transport section, and they, they were the group that flew equipment over the Himalayas, they call it the hump, to the soldiers in China. He flew over a hundred missions on that while in the service. Robert, he was in medical school, but he finished, when he finished medical school, he was enlisted into the Navy, and he was assigned to a, a ship that would be in the Atlantic. Keith, the youngest was, and Keith lived most of his adult life in Georgetown. He was in the infantry and he ended up in Italy. So all four of us, when the, it always amazed me that when the war happened and when Pearl Harbor was bombed, that I've often wondered what my mother thought. That, and well, I know she never dreamed that all four of her sons would be in this war. And everybody came home? Huh? Everybody came back home? And all of them, all of us lived a long time. Oh, she must have been so relieved. <laughs> Aren't you want another sob story? Absolutely. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, we were married while I was in the service, while I was in training. She was living in Andrews with her parents that when I was shot down. When, we, when you're missing in action, the government sends you a letter and sends the next of kin. So they sent a telegram to my wife informing her that we regret to inform you that your husband is missing in action on such and such a date. When the telegram came, the tele, telegraph operator, he didn't want to take the te telegram to her. So he went to my home and asked daddy if he would take it to her. So Daddy and Mama took the telegram around to Jack's mother's place where she was staying, and they gave it to her. And after the shot wore off, and by the way, Jack said that this was the hardest day of her life. But after that, Daddy and Mama said, we want you to come and live with us. So he brought the wives to live as long as they could at the house. And one of my sisters came and lived at the house. And Daddy says, we need to be together until this thing is over. What was it like when you came back and got to that first day when you got to see everyone again? <laughs> Wonderful. In fact, I, I don't know whether it was that day or the next day, uh, they all encouraged me to tell for it a little bit, and when I was telling it, my sister Sarah, she actually took notes, and I figured that is the best record that I've ever had. <laughs> I can still keep, I keep it to this day. But it was great to be home, and it was great to be, and we were, of course, the, the war, and, and when I got home, now the war in Japan wasn't over, and but when that was, we were, my wife and myself were sitting in a swing under the grape arbor, when we heard that, they heard that the Japanese had surrendered, and we were so happy. And I mean, we were just delighted because we, we, I knew that when I reported back to the Air Force that I'd be sent to the Pacific to be trained for the invasion of Japan. And of course, as you know, that didn't happen. President Harry Truman ordered them to drop the bombs. He made the statement that when American soldiers are being killed in a battle, America will use every weapon it has. He dropped the bombs and it ended the war. It was one of the greatest things that he did. And he did a lot of great things for this country and for the people of this country.